All right, folks. So what we have here is a book about antenna impedance matching, and naturally it covers some things about SWR. I showed this on a different video, and I said I was really enjoying reading it. It's about 40 years old. Um, it's by a guy named Wilford Karen. And uh, I, some people bought these, or they got uh, copies of downloads or whatever, so they got access to the book. One of my buddies asked me a question about a chart that is in the book, and it's somewhere right around here and let me zoom in real quick and when we take a look at this chart it shows a couple of different things uh here it has percentage of power transmitted so this scale is not watts this scale is percent and out of 100 percent transmitted you come over here and you look at percentage of reflected power at the bottom you have your standing wave ratio or your swr value so what you would do is, is that you would say my SWR is 2.0. So if I'm transmitting 100% of my power, which you always are, I should mention this assumes lossless coax cable, meaning that there's no loss in your coax cable. Let's get that thing to zoom back in. There we go. So if we transmit 100% of our power, we have an SWR of 2.0. Two, uh, 2 we go up on this line, on this curve right here, and it's about 89% of our power is making its way to the antenna. Conversely, if you come over here and you take a look at me, it's about 12% of our power is being reflected. We're going to talk a little bit about why. We're going to talk a little bit about SWR, and then we're going to take a better look at this chart. So I think the first question that we get asked here is, what is SWR? And it's called standing wave ratio. And it is basically a ratio based off of the amount of forward power or transmitted power from your radio. And it, com it compares that to the amount of reflected power that comes back off of your load. In the case of amateur radio operators, this would be our antenna. Now, whenever I talk about SWR and I refer to it as VSWR or voltage standing wave ratio, because we look at the voltage, somebody comes along, some angry ham, and they say, well, you can do current standing wave ratio and look at current, not voltage. Okay, that's fine. But today we're talking about voltage. And so it measures the impedance of uh, the, the difference between your transmission line and the load. So a lower SWR is a better match for your antenna. One to one is a perfect SWR. When it starts to creep above that, you start to have problems. In some cases, SWR, <laughs> this is where it gets a little tricky, and we'll, we'll look at a diagram to explain it a little bit better. But in some cases, your reflected wave can come back and can also cause damage to your radio, like your finals. Most modern radios have some kind of foldback mechanism so that when they detect this high SWR condition, what they do is they lower their power output levels to protect the final amplification stage. And that's a good thing. But older radios don't have that, and it can cause some kind of havoc for you. Now, typically, I start to get nervous around my a 1.5 to 2 to 1 SWR. And some people say, hey, well, that's, that's probably still fine. And it is. A lot of modern antenna tuner, I'm sorry, a lot of modern an, uh, ham radios come with a built-in internal tuner that handles about a 3 to 1 SWR. But a lot of hams like myself will use an external antenna tuner. If you want to learn more about antenna tuners, I've got tons of videos on those. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what causes high SWR. And at its core, it's an impedance mismatch, typically between your feeder line, most cases coaxial cable, and the load, which would be our antenna. I think we talked about that earlier. In some cases, people don't use coaxial cable. And let me mention that not all coaxial cable is exactly 50 ohms. Sometimes it's 48, sometimes it's 53. But it's usually around 50 ohms, and that's really not a problem for us. Some folks will use balanced feeder line, like ladder line or window line, uh, twin line, and that can be 300, 450, 600 ohms. And in those cases, they'll use a tuner to correct that, or they'll use a circuit that's called a transmatch. And what the transmatch does is it does an impedance match there. And um, things will work out <laughs> just fine for you. Um, antenna size impacts SWR. So if your antenna is too long, it will look inductive and that adds inductive reactance and that will generally make your antenna, um, have a higher impedance and it will, it will give you an SWR reading higher than one to one. Uh, conversely, if your antenna is too short, it will look, um, it, it, it will look capacitive, right? And that's a capacitive reactance and that will uh, cause your SWR to be higher than one to one. 
Another thing that can cause problems are loose or bad connections. So you want to make sure that all of your connections into the back of the radio, into your tuner, from the tuner to whatever coaxial transmission line, whatever you're using, into your antenna feed point, if you're using a choke in your choke, make sure those connections are tight. Make sure that they are waterproofed and you don't have any water ingress in there and they're free from corrosion. Um, bad or damaged transmission line can cause a little bit of a problem. If your transmission line's running across your backyard and squirrels chew on it or the lawn guy hits it and puts a nick in the wire, you can get water ingress in there and that can cause you a problem. It can cause corrosion and can cause impedance mismatch problems there. Also, the antenna location. So if an antenna is near something that is reactive, like a rusty Buick, uh, for example, or a swing set or, or something like that in your backyard, the that metal can cause reactance through capacitive coupling to your antenna and can mess with your SWR. Also, the height above ground can change. The, the coupling that your antenna has with ground can change your SWR. So, like for example, a dipole antenna mounted a half a wavelength high is about 73 ohms. And that would be around a 1.5 uh, to 1 SWR. Now, if you lower that, it might come down to 50 and be perfectly matched. Exact same antenna, height above ground doesn't matter. Okay, so here is a graphic that I was able to put together, and I really wanted to use this to talk about standing wave behavior. And, you know, a lot of times people say, hey, I don't want the swerves coming back into my radio and causing problems, or my swerves are coming back, or my swerves are being reflected and re-reflected. A standing wave does not move. And a lot of times, uh, grouchy hams will actually yell at somebody if they get this wrong, if they say, hey, my standing wave, my SWR is coming back into my radio. It doesn't, right? So it lives on the transmission line. And this is where we have a little bit of a problem. So your standing wave here on this chart is in white. And that is the sum of the voltage that is traveling on your transmission line. In this case, the incident wave or our transmitted wave is moving from left to right, moving from our radio to our antenna. That's a moving wave or traveling wave. The red is a reflected wave, and that is the reflection coming off of our impedance mismatch coming the reverse direction down our transmission line. So when, when this happens, you do have two traveling waves, and you do have energy coming back into your tuner, coming back into your radio, regardless of what anybody tells you around how standing waves are called standing, because they stand, they don't move, they're stationary. Now, if you take a look at this, it makes perfect sense that our incident wave is larger than our reflected wave because only a portion of that comes back. Even if you had 100% of your transmitted signal coming back, then they would be the same size. This is in a lossless system. So please, please, angry hams, don't get all upset and say, well, you're going to have loss on your reflected wave, so it's going to be smaller. Yes, that's true. We're talking conceptually in a lossless transmission line, and I know no such thing really exists. Anyhow... <clears throat> the standing wave, as I mentioned, is the sum of both waves, and it moves in amplitude up and down. It doesn't move left to right. It looks like it's moving, but it's not. It's just moving up and down as the voltage of the two traveling waves changes at its height. It's called a voltage maxima. That's the high point. At the low, it's called a voltage minima. And again, that is the sum of both of the, of the traveling waves, both incident and reflected. Okay, so here's our chart, and it's funny because my buddy actually took this picture, and uh, he was the one who was asking me about this, and I think we explained it pretty well. Again, on the left-hand side, we have our transmitted percentage. On the right-hand side, we have the reflected power, and the bottom is our standing wave ratio. So again, what you would do on this chart is you would take a look at your standing wave ratio, find that value on the bottom of the chart, and then you would <laughs> you would go up to where you have the curve. And then from that point on the curve, you would move it over to the right-hand side, and you would see how much is reflected. If you move it to the left-hand side, you will see how much of that power is being transmitted and absorbed into the antenna. That doesn't mean that your signal is radiated. In your antenna, you have two things that take place. One, power is absorbed and dissipated uh, as heat via ohmic uh, resistance, right? So it just says, hey, power came in here, the antenna got hot, and it turned into heat. The rest of that is what's called radiation resistance, and that's how much of your signal uh, is converted. So they call an antenna a transducer because it takes, it takes this RF current that's coming in off the wire, and then it turns it into RF energy in space. And your radiated power is what goes out into space. 
Now, how that goes out in space depends upon all kinds of things like the, the geometry of your antenna, the height above ground, and it goes in different directions, and that's called a radiation pattern. So here's a, a just chart that I put together based off of the diagram. It explains that curve in more detail. So at an SWR of 1.0, power transmitted, 100% of the power is transmitted and zero is reflected. As our SWR increases, the mismatch increases, more reflection and less delivered power. And then we have a table, and in the first column, it shows just different SWR values. And then we have the power transmitted, and then we have the power reflected. Here you can see different common values that people talk about, right? So like at a 2 to 1 SWR, that's 89% power transmitted, 11% reflected, assuming a lossless coaxial cable. When we use an antenna tuner to match our, our antenna to our characteristic impedance of 50 ohms on a radio... What we do is we create something called a conjugate match, and that is a mirror reflection of the input impedance to our antenna, and that's now on our tuner. When this reflected wave comes back and hits that conjugate match, most of it re-reflects back towards our antenna. And so that power does get delivered back to the antenna, minus any losses in your transmission line, and will radiate. Now, as you start to go further down in your SWR scale, things get a little bit more tricky. At a 3 to 1 SWR, about 25% of your power is reflected. The more power that gets reflected, if we go back to our other chart where we had the live diagram, the bigger that reflected wave comes back. And what that means is the bigger that our standing wave comes back. And that means more voltage on your coaxial cable, for example. Coaxial cables rated to handle a certain amount of voltage. As that voltage increases, you risk a dielectric breakdown. And what can happen is, is that you can get arcing between the center conductor of your coaxial cable and the insulative shield on the outside. When arcing happens, that's bad. You don't want that to happen. So it's a good idea to understand how much voltage you do have on your coaxial cable and what your coaxial cable is rated for. So what I did with the help of AI is create this chart. And this is an easier to read version of what is in the book. The scale here changes, right? So it only went up to the impact of, of 10 SWR, which is what I did on the bottom scale. But what I did is adjust the um, left and right scales to go all the way down to 100%. Hopefully this is a little bit easier to read. And if you want, you can do a screenshot of this, print it out, laminate it, and keep it in your wallet. Anyhow, hopefully this helps folks out. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below and I'll do my best to respond. As always, thank you for watching.